This way, please. Pardon, young sir. I was at my devotions. I did not hear you. I trust I haven't disturbed you. Well, don't tell me the joint's haunted. You think I'm mad, don't you? I believe you. Oh, my darling. What have they done to you? She has been dead for 20 years. <laughs> Amen. Doors closing by themselves. People talking to nothing and getting answers. I'm going back. So even if the house does seem haunted, I'm sure that... They're coming to get you, Barbara. Come on, show yourself, you coward. Did I hear somebody scream? I'm John Carradine, your host on a journey through Hollywood, a rather different side of Hollywood that you've probably never seen before. You see, this town is haunted. One of the most famous hauntings took place during the making of the film The Exorcist. The author of the book and film, William Peter Blatty, remembers some of the strange occurrences that started even before the shooting of the film actually began. wife kept insisting that she had seen the telephone receiver lift like this right off the hook of itself. Well, I didn't know what to make of that, frankly, but a couple of days later, I was sitting right next to that phone, and it was sitting on a very stable, flat base, flat surface, and it rang, and I was a heavy smoker at the time. I reached for my pack of cigarettes before answering the telephone, and before I could put my hand on it, I watched the telephone, the receiver lift from the cradle, just enough to clear it and fall off the hook. Strange occurrences continued to happen. One of the actors died. Carpenters received mutilating injuries. The producer decided to call in a priest to bless the set. Uh, there was a cessation of these uh, uh, problems uh, after the blessing, after the first blessing. And they did not recur until we changed locations from New York to Georgetown. And they started again, and the same Jesuit who was my teacher in high school, actually, Father Tom Birmingham, uh, was called out and he blessed us again, and it stopped. But again, I, 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 as, as a Catholic and, and a man of faith, I certainly believe, and, and a man of reason, I think, I certainly believe that uh, something unknowable was operating on us at the time. church performs very few exorcisms in the United States. In fact, so far as I know, there have only been three in the last 50, perhaps 60 years. What's that? Holy water. You keep it away. It burns! It burns! Before allowing such an exorcism to take place. A rigorous investigation is conducted, and among the signs of possession are 
clearly visible exterior, undeniably paranormal phenomenon. Well, you know, when the um, Exorcist came out, I think that really started people today uh, into knowing or feeling that they had some relationship to possession, either in their family or that they were possessed. And it stirred up a lot of interest throughout the country, and psychologists and parapsychologists were suddenly being uh, swamped with calls by people who felt that they were either possessed themselves or somebody dear to them was. It just so happens that somebody very close to me is, is probably possessed and needs an exorcist. Blatty was inspired to write the story by a true incident that occurred in St. Louis, Missouri to a 14-year-old boy back in 1949. His family first heard footsteps coming from the wall, strange scratching noises and accompanying drum beats. His personality began to become sinister along with his physical appearance. And red marks emerged on his skin, some of them actually spelling answers to questions the family asked the boy. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, by this sign of the Holy Cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, who lives and reigns with the Father and the Holy Spirit, David! Amen. Uh, finally, one must say, well, what really went on? And finally, the answer is, we don't know. But one thing that we do know is, we have no natural explanation for it. You know, starring in a ghost movie is one thing. But to actually live it in your own home is another looking up to see a stranger in the living room, only to watch him fade before your eyes. As actress Elke Summer and her writer husband, Joe Hyam, can attest to, living in a haunted house can be a trying experience. And then, of course, things would move all the time, and it would be very noisy and the usual poltergeist uh, nonsense, you know. You'd make marks for the chairs, and then you're the only people in the house, and then you come down that the chairs are totally in different positions. After battling the spirits for months with no results, Elke and her husband decided to look for help. And we decided, well, it's time to look into that matter a little more carefully, and we went to the Parapsychological Institute at UCLA, where, among a lot of other very interesting people, I must say, we met a fascinating lady um, by the name of Thelma Moss. They would wake up and hear noises as, as though there were a dinner party going on. Tables, uh, silverware, cutlery, all that kind of thing. Glasses being tinkled uh, back and forth. And they would get this on tape. What they didn't understand is when they would go downstairs and look in the dining room, nothing had changed. Chairs were there, no people were there, no voices, no cutlery. So that they were concerned about what would happen in that particular house. I mean, for all those skeptics out there, which I used to be, believe me, how do you explain, like, 30 people independently from one another walking through the house, and each one going into the same room, which was the dining room, into the same corner, and saying, hey, that's where we feel it or him, or whatever you want to call him or it. There would be a corner where if you pointed a camera, you couldn't take a picture because it's just the camera would block you pointed to another corner of the room and you had your picture i don't believe in ghosts i never have and uh but it was a good story to shoot and they had all the evidence visually for me to capture on film uh, except that something happened which kind of spooked me because on one roll of film that i shot uh in the particular room where they first spotted the ghost there was about four frames or five frames of film progressively fogged down to the end of the frame, giving it a ghost-like appearance, especially Joe Himes, who was in the shot. And uh, when that was processed, and I took a look at that, I thought there was no way that could have happened either in by some body in a lab or whatever. Usually it would happen at the beginning of a roll, 
where you had access to light as you loaded a camera. But to appear in the center of a roll, frames, I think it was 15 to 18, something else had happened that I couldn't explain. And I spent years in, in, as a photographer, and that had never happened to me before. So being a skeptic when I went in, coming out, something did happen in that house. Then, a very interesting thing, one of the psychics who went through the house said, I get a strong feeling that there's going to be a fire breaks out in the dining room, and within the next year, the owners of the house, whoever they are, are going to have to jump from the second story from their bedroom in order to avoid the fire. Well, I wrote that down. That was all part of the data. The article was published in the journal of the American Society for Psychical Research, a very prestigious uh, parapsychological journal, and forgotten about. But eight months later, in the Los Angeles Times, there was a front page picture of Elkie Summers and Joe Hams jumping from their second story bedroom window in order to escape from the fire that had broken out. The fireman could never detect how the fire started, but it did start in the dining room. After the fire, Elkie and Joe decided to move. Despite the house's history becoming known nationwide, it had no problem being resold again and again and again. It's, it's unnatural in, in a period of, I don't know, uh, some years to change owners 17 times. And that's a lot of new owners. And everybody says, hey, goes, sure, yes, sure. Like the people who had the party. They had a party, a Halloween party. They all came with sheets and who and everything. And then they said, sure, Elke, you know, and Joe, they're crazy. And goes, sure, goes. They lived there about two weeks by the time. And um, stewardess. And they were sitting at... Um, dinner, at the dinner table, in the dining room, in said room, and making all kinds of jokes and saying, hey, go, some woman, and, the, and they had a beautiful chandelier which they had bought. We had a kind of pishke one compared to that. Really, I mean, they said, really nice, big crystal chandelier, and all of a sudden, it just went, Phew! whole chandelier came down and I nearly severed somebody's arm. Little things like that, to keep life interesting. <laughs> Uh, I would like to talk quite a bit about poltergeists because I understand them and have experienced them as very mischievous kind of fun-loving spirits that don't do anything like what was described in that very fascinating movie, Poltergeist, which had a lot of drama and a lot of melodrama and a lot of uh, macabre things going on. Nothing in that film related really to anything that a poltergeist does, except for that first very charming episode in the dining room when the chairs got moved around and there were certain places that got spooked. Uh, did you do this? Uh, uh. Hey guys. Ask you to pull the chairs. However, let's make it very clear. I have never known a poltergeist to do anything evil, anything macabre, like taking a child out of its uh, domain and bringing it into a closet where it's suddenly in another special territory. <laughs> Frank DeFelita, author of Audrey Rose and The Entity, and also a Hollywood producer, once had a most unusual supernatural experience. 20 years ago, I did a documentary for NBC. It was called The Stately Ghosts of England. I went to England in order to have some fun with the lords and ladies and their haunted manners. I thought it was going to be a big kick, but it turned out to be one of the most horrifying experiences of my life. During his first days of shooting at a reportedly haunted mansion, De Felita could get no image on the film at all. So he went to London and had the cameras checked out, as well as the film stock. 
but both were in perfect condition. NBC was ready to fire him and cancel the whole project. So in a last ditch effort, the Felita decided to return to the haunted house. We got to a place called Longleat on the southern coast of England, a big manor house with about 100 rooms. It was famous for having a ghost that walked in the third floor hallway, the corridor. It was known as the haunted corridor. We had a clairvoyant with us. His name was Tom Corbett. He told me that the thing that was wrong is that I'd asked permission of everyone but the essential people, the ghosts. Well, I, if I felt humorous at all, I would have laughed at that. And he said that the only way that I could fix it was to go up into the uh, third floor corridor, talk to the ghost, and ask permission. Well, I did. I was so desperate that I actually went upstairs in the dead of night, and I asked, would you please let me make this film? Well, lo and behold, the next day, we got perfect film. I, I cannot explain it. I was not a believer in ghosts until that time. In fact, even after that time, I wasn't at all convinced of what had happened there. De Felita set up a time-lapse camera in the haunted corridor. And what he caught on film just might be one of the rarest pieces of evidence as to the reality of ghosts. It was a light that went from one part of the hallway up to, to a doorway and the uh, forward part of the hallway. This light went from one doorway into another. I had to meet with the people. At least they wanted to meet with me. This was Thelma Moss and her crew. And they wanted to see this particular piece of film, and I showed it to them. Well, they were so enraptured by it that they remembered me the next time an important case came up. And that's when they called me up and told me about this very haunted house in Culver City, practically in my own backyard. And what I found when I went there were a lot of students and a woman, a very brave woman, a very simple woman, uh, who was being beset by an entity. actual story was based on a little house in Culver City where there was a lady living with her children in lower middle class home who felt that indeed she was being attacked physically by something she couldn't see and ran into two of my graduate students in a bookstore because they were looking for books on ghosts and she said to them I've got a problem in my house and they said we'll be very happy to come and take a look at your house and they brought her into the uh, Neuropsychiatric Institute to be tested by medical doctors because she did have black and blue marks all over her and she had teeth blights on her neck, which is very hard to do unless you get a pair of false teeth and inflict it on yourself. And during that case, we experienced a plethora of phenomena. More, more things happened than in any other case we've been involved with. One of the first things that occurred uh, happened in the kitchen. A lower cabinet door slammed open and a pan came flying out. The trajectory of the pan was elliptical. It landed about three feet from the cabinet. Then the lady screamed out the ghost was in her bedroom and we went in there 
and we saw little pops of light, but eventually we started seeing large balls of light. Now by this time, we had brought in five professional photographers covering every angle of the room. And balls of light would appear in the darkness that were fully dimensional. We could see them from all sides. They were in motion, moving across the room. And they would last for up to a minute. And at that point, she just let out a scream and said, you're afraid of me. The reason you don't come is because I have my army and you're afraid of me. Come on. Come on, show yourself, you coward. Now that I've got my forces here with me, let's just see how brave you are. We were all ducking. These things were firing all over the place. I first thought it was some kind of short, but it wasn't. They seemed to have a purpose and a name. And at that point, she started laughing and saying, well, you're showing us your lights, but you're not showing us yourself. Show us yourself, you damned coward. Is that all you got the guts to do? Is there anybody like you? Come on, we don't want fireworks, we want you. Show yourself, you. And suddenly, he appeared. And I'm saying, this thing appeared. It was the most amazing thing I, I think that I've ever seen. And from that point on, I truly believe that there's something beyond our world. Unfortunately, received no help from us, no help from the local priest, no help from anyone, and she decided to move away because she was afflicted by this sensation of being physically attacked. She moved to Texas, and I'm sorry to say that that entity, whatever it was, seemed to be attached to the family rather than to the house, and it moved with her to Texas. The real life evil doings and the entity were not limited to the West Coast. At the same time, Frank DeFolita was recording the events in Culver City, California. An entire family in New York was being victimized by strange occurrences in their home. That house gave inspiration to one of Hollywood's all-time supernatural hits, the Amityville Horror. It's an old community on Long Island in New York, and uh, supposedly the house was built on Indian burial ground and spirits of the Indians still exist, of course. Then there was another story that the house was also on that exact spot, it had been the house of a warlock. I forget the name of the guy who lived there. But supposedly come down out of Rhode Island when they had the witchcraft trials and moved in and built that house there. And so there was some history to the area and to that specific house. <laughs> George and Kathy Lott's family moved into the house after these murders, and they stayed only 28 days. During that time, they experienced some abnormal events.
but the Lutzes claim many strange things. The uh, children having nightmares, the daughter talking to the pig, having this strange thing in the house, in her room, that only she could see. Who are you singing to, Princess? You scared Jody. Jody? No, there's no one here, see? You scared her. She went out the window. She went out the window? Well, I, I better check and make sure she's not still there, huh? Yeah. I mean, one of the things was the Lutzes did go into the room at night and there was the rocking chair rocking by itself, uh, noises coming out of the basement, uh, unnatural cold in one of the rooms, uh, the priest having problems with the flies in the house and getting sick. <laughs> Chuck Moses uh, investigated, and I think he did a lie detector test with the Lutzes, which proved, according to him, that they were telling the truth. And the first thing that I did was, was to have them submit to uh, polygraph examinations here in uh, Hollywood. And uh, they passed those uh, examinations with flying colors, so that uh, whether you believe anything happened in that house or not, or whether it did or not, the tests more or less brought out that they believed uh, what they were saying and what they saw. I can't possibly see how this could be a hoax. I mean, I do know the Lutzes left. They moved out of the house. They left their possessions in the house. I think she left her jewelry, if I remember, upstairs. There were clothes in the dryer. There was food in the freezer. There were too many things that they left in the house on, to create a hoax. Normally, when you create a hoax, you would do it for, for a purpose monetary gain, some kind of gain. What kind of gain could they possibly get out of leaving the house, walking away from it? They didn't have a book contract when they left the house. Even if they had had a book contract, there was no guarantee that the book would possibly be a bestseller. They did not have a movie contract. And if they did have a movie contract, there was no guarantee that the movie would be come out and be successful. Laos and town have survived the Amityville horror. But the townspeople are as spit as ever about what really happened. Yeah, I believe so. I think so, because I know a lot of people who have gone into the house after this had happened, and they get scared, and they ran out, and stuff like that. But there really hasn't been anybody interested in buying the house or anything else like that. Yeah, they do believe it's haunted. Uh, I didn't go see any of the movies, because I didn't want to waste my money to go see them. Uh, I know the story is not true, OK? I have heard that the people who have read the book and seen the movies, that uh, someone was supposedly possessed, the house was haunted, and mysterious things were going on. And none of it is true. It's just not true. The Committee for the Scientific Investigation of Claims of the Paranormal would not have really been interested in the Amityville horror had they not purported it to be something that was based on fact. Well, the second that it was purported to be a true story, we sent out a team to investigate it. And uh, what they found was that many of the claims based in the book and in the movie uh, were not true. And uh, the, the priest, for instance, had not gone to the house at great length, and they just talked to him on the phone and things like this. There was a real priest who had gone to the house, who had had difficulties in the house, had gotten sick, had had trouble with his automobile on the way after leaving the house. It was just, just what it is in the media. If they say it's true, then it makes it much more interesting, and it makes more people see the movie, and it makes it more interesting than if it was just fiction. In this house, it is dangerous for those who ridicule. Spirits are strongly displeased with the skeptical. I can understand exactly how they feel. 
Ex as far as experiences of my own are concerned, I have gone at the beginning of my career to investigate maybe 50 or 60 houses that were presumed to be haunted. I never saw anything of any interest. After I left, people would tell me all hell broke loose, and eventually I got bored with that because I wanted hell to break loose while somebody was there to photograph it. So what I did was to get two graduate students who were awfully good at their work, and when they went, things did happen. During the past 12 years, I've investigated 650 cases. And during that time, only a few of them have produced anything worthwhile, less than 1%. Now, that doesn't mean that the other cases aren't legitimate. It's very difficult for a researcher to be in the right place at the right time. Stunts and illusions. I think that you'll find that there's a fraction of 1% that are really legitimate cases. Most of the cases that come in are really psychologically based and due to certain types of emotions or things happening within a family or with a particular person. And though they may believe that supernatural things are happening, when in fact uh, we find that there's very little basis for it. We have our business and you have your business. Please. Do not refer to my calling as a business. Oh, no offense. I just meant that everybody has to stick to his own racket. Racket? Do you dare to suggest that the practice of the occult sciences is a racket? Do not merely suggest it, Mr. Kaiser. Insist upon it. What is a skeptic? Well, a skeptic isn't a person who denies the existence of something. All I'm ask, we ask, a skeptic asks for is proof of something. You say you can burst into flames? Well, come before us and burst into flames. But you have to do it by some other means than dousing yourself with turpentine and setting a match to yourself. You can set up, you can, it takes less than a minute to make any sort of crazy claim. I can say, for instance, I've gone to Venus and walked around. I don't have to, it's not up to the skeptic to prove the person uh, wrong. It's up to the person who makes the claim to uh, substantiate it or give evidence. And until they prove it with proper evidence, and that needs careful investigation, I will remain skeptical. It's easy to become a skeptic, especially after watching hundreds of ghost, poltergeist, and evil possessions Hollywood has given us. It's a natural question to ask how seriously we should take the supernatural. Nearly 60 years ago, Sir Arthur Conan Doyle, creator of Sherlock Holmes, used his own knowledge of deductive reasoning to support his beliefs in the supernatural. There are two things that people always want to ask me. Well, one of them is how I ever came to write the Sherlock Holmes stories. And the other is about how I came to have psychic experiences and to take so much interest in that question. When I talk on this subject, I'm not talking about what I believe. I'm not talking about what I think. I'm talking about what I know. There's an enormous difference, believe me, between believing a thing and knowing a thing. I'm talking about things that I've handled, that I've seen, that I've heard with my own ears. And I always mind you in the presence of witnesses. I never risk hallucination. More recently, Actress Susan Strasberg had a very personal supernatural experience. One day, a close friend told her that she had received a message from the actress' late father, famed acting coach Lee Strasberg. The message had told them to go find a personal note written by Strasberg himself. So the day came when we had been told to, I had been told to do this thing, and with much trepidation, thinking, oh, I'm crazy, and why am I going to do this? I'll be disappointed, and it can't be, and maybe she was making it up and, you know, not meaning to. And so I got a writer friend of mine and uh, a doctor because I thought I wanted to have two witnesses so they couldn't say that I had made it up, and followed the sort of game plan that my father had told us. And down the line, from A to Z, everything happened as he had said that it would. The message was in a place where he had said it would be, in the container that he had said it would be in. And it was a message that dealt with um, the immortality of the human soul, which was not something 
that I, my father, I think, would ever have said while he was still alive. Eyewitnesses in Hollywood are still experiencing strange encounters, many at their very own studios. The stories may be unusual, but the eyewitnesses speak for themselves. It was a Sunday night about 10 o'clock in the evening, pretty cold, and stage five called down and asked me to come up and lock up the stage. I went down to the stage, turned off the lights on the lower part of the stage, locked up the door, and turned around and came back toward the door. Just before I left, I wanted to make sure that nobody was in the stage and locked up. So I yelled out, is there anybody in here? And didn't hear anything, turned around to lock up the stage again, and heard, turned around and heard a voice way up in the catwalks. I looked up in the catwalks, and the, we have a house light that is mounted about four feet, five feet from the catwalk. It started swinging about six, eight feet in an arch about half a dozen times. I turned around, I looked at the uh, PA guy, and I said, you did hear that? And he said, yes. And I said, you did hear a voice? And he said, yes. I looked up there and I said, is anybody up there? There was no answer. So I backed up, got a very nervous feeling about it, closed the stage and walked away. We walked over to the end of the stage where the staircase was. We sat down and proceeded having lunch. Within a few minutes or so, there were footsteps in front of us and it seemed like they were at the other end of the stage. There was nothing in the way of me seeing any anyone coming in or going out of the stage. I thought it was kind of funny and I looked up on the catwalks and I thought, well, it would be impossible for anyone to be here because the stage was dark when I came in. We uh, decided to keep on having lunch and um, a few seconds later, the footsteps were directly in front of us and they were walking towards us and there was no one there. I got a call one night from one of my guards who was standing watch on a small stage in Hollywood. It was rather unusual because he said there was all kinds of strange things happening. So at midnight when I got off work, I drove over there. I arrived about 12.15. Uh, he let me in and we started walking around and music was coming out of the walls. The, uh, after being there about 25 minutes, the uh, temperature just went down to frigid. It was really cold. So we investigated further. There was no one on the stage. All the doors was locked. And when I left, the temperature was back down to normal and the music had stopped. And needless to say, he put in for a transfer. Hauntings have taken place in the strangest of locations. I've investigated quite a number of sites of Hollywood, including the old Houdini estate on Laurel Canyon Boulevard. All that's left is a staircase today that the main mansion burned down decades ago. But many people have reported apparitions on that staircase. Some believe it to be the, the magician himself, Harry Houdini. As you know, Houdini publicly was a skeptic as far as psychic phenomena was concerned. That's not uncommon. Most magicians, and particularly those at the level at, of, of Houdini, have had the same attitude or response, that psychic phenomena uh, is not legitimate, and I think that Houdini felt so because he was able to create so many illusions himself, but they were done technically and mechanically. Houdini made a pact with his wife. He said that if there were an afterlife, he would communicate a code to her. One of these supernatural affairs to cover tomorrow night, Martha. If you're interested, come on along. Mm, you give me a queer feeling. But this is something worthwhile. Madame Houdini is going to try to contact her dead husband, the great Harry Houdini. You know, um, he promised to contact her within 10 years' time through a certain code, if such a thing were possible. Yes, I remember reading something about it. Tomorrow will mark the 10th anniversary of his death, and it'll be Madame Houdini's final attempt to communicate with him. A very famous psychic, American psychic by the name of Arthur Ford, claimed privately uh, to, to Mrs. Houdini that he did indeed have the code, and when they met, he, he gave her the code, and. Uh, the next day she arranged for a press conference where she acknowledged that 
uh, Arthur Ford had indeed provided the very precise code that Houdini had arranged with his wife. Now, the, the, the final aspects of the story are even more interesting. Mrs. Houdini had, had been involved with and, and was raised in a, a Christian church. She was a very devout and loyal woman to her church. And uh, within a, a day after her public announcement, uh, officials of the church called upon her and persuaded her to retract her statement, which she did do. And uh, through to the end, she maintained that it was no one had ever successfully broken the code or provided it uh, to her. I'm glad to see you back, madame. I could hardly wait. Was a seance a success? Mary. Yes, madame. There will be no more seances. Oh, I'm so sorry, but they've proven a failure. But they haven't. Not exactly. Mary, you knew my husband a long time. Oh, yes, madame. And you remember what he always said about these things? That it was impossible for the dead to return. This proves he was right. For if it would have been possible, I would have had some sign from him in the past 10 years. Well, that is over. But I would have loved to have talked with him just once. He and I investigated the home of silent heartthrob Rudolph Valentino, a lady who claimed that Rudolph Valentino was haunting her house. We did some historic research and discovered that, yes, indeed, that had been the home of Rudolph Valentino back in the 20s when they were filming the silent classic, The Sheik. We did find a ghost, too. A troubled spirit had been seen, a misty apparition. Valentino died, and his death became a national tragedy. His funeral, an international event. For two years, his house remained abandoned until actor Harry Carey moved in. But Carey discovered that he wasn't alone in the house. He reported that he was sharing it with the ghost of Valentino. The following year, a newsreel, Ghosts of Hollywood, recorded the haunted visits. Perched high upon this crest, like the nest of an eagle, he appropriately named this abode Falcon Lair. Through this gate and up to the tower room, which was his den, his retreat, he was wont to go so often that it became a daily habit and it is claimed by those near and dear to him that the spectral being of the departed Valentino still haunts the window where he gazed down upon the place he learned to love so well, Hollywood. Hauntings are also memories that come back, usually based on tragedies that happened in a place. They're also uh, supposedly people who have passed over and have not accepted that and have lived in a place an awful long time. And a lot of people report strange things happening when they start rebuilding on the premises, moving furniture around, uh, building walls, taking down walls, etc. The spirits evidently don't like that of the people who passed over, supposedly. Not far from Falcon Lair is the former house of another reported ghost, George Superman Reeves, whose mysterious death still haunts this town. Yeah. Yeah? Good. That's a call I've been waiting for, Miss Lane. Everything's been taken care of, except you. Blakey, you don't. You just get a few years for the jewel robbery. But for this... That's the chance I gotta take. No, I don't believe it. You will, Blinky. You will. Just wasting your ammunition, Blinky. Sit down. Hey, let me out. Let me out! 
Another few seconds and it would have been too late, Superman. Well, it wasn't, Miss Lay, and that's what counts. What time is it? Just about 12.30. Well, I can't wait for the police. I have an appointment date. Excuse me. Well, you won't have to worry about riding your pals now, Blinky. For the children of the 50s, there was no more tragic figure in haunted Hollywood than George Reeves, Superman, the man of steel, dead in his bedroom of a bullet wound to the head. How George Reeves died on June 16th, 1959, may always remain a mystery, but reports of his afterlife visits may be even more unexplainable. The house has had several residences since Reeves died. One couple reported hearing noises in the bedroom. They went up to the room, only to find the Man of Steel dressed as Superman, staring at them and slowly disappearing from in front of their eyes. The couple moved out that night and never returned. And so, boys and girls, be super citizens and have a super future by saving regularly with United States saving stamps at school. And keep on making me and everyone else as proud of you as we are today. Bye now. Bye. We've taken a journey through hauntings that have affected people not only on the screen, but also in where they work and where they live. Yet I think we can all agree that the only way you would want to see ghosts is on a movie screen, in a darkened theater, the safe way to be scared. But I warn you, for those who scoff at their existence, the spirits consider no punishment too drastic. But the beginning and for a long time we had uh, a very clear distinction between good and evil the good guys wore the white hats the bad guys wore the black hats and then suddenly after world war ii there was a slight change notice and as time went on we found out that everyone was suddenly wearing a gray hat because films no longer took a distinct stand about morality about good and evil. Through the 60s and into the 70s, there was more and more evidence that uh, evil, per se, was never defined. She thinks that the child is evil? She also thinks the child isn't hers. <laughs>
Medium's respiration, 210. Dynamometer, 1460. Temperature. Evidence of ozone in the air. Ectoplasm forming. Separate filaments exuding from fingertips of both hands, uniting to form two separate strands. Two strands moving toward each other. As scary as evil ghosts are, Hollywood has just as often let the supernatural show us our own comical side that not-so-brave side that comes out when we have to go into a dark room or investigate a strange noise. Would you mind telling me where you ladies are taking me? To the Carrington estate. Uh-oh. Is there anything wrong with the Carrington place? Yes, ma'am. Well, if there wasn't anybody living there, it'd be a haunted house. Uh. Get your cold feet off my back. You don't need all the covers, do you? Here I am, Toppy. Remember me, the girl that sat on your lap? Oh, this is terrible. What's terrible? You're a ghost. You're dead. No kidding. Okay, you've got to get out of here. I've had enough trouble with your kind of people. Mr. Tower! Hey, Eddie, got a cigarette? Give me a match. Did you see the way that fire came on? What fire? All I can see in this room is you. I'm a witch. A witch? I knew it all the time. You did? Of course. I've been under your spell since the moment I met you. Hey, did you just pass here? Yes. Yes, of course. I brought a trunk down from the attic. A trunk? Yes. Were we here? I couldn't say. Mm. Well, maybe we're not here now. Maybe. Maybe. Mm. Well, do you see anything? No. No. Who that? Who that? Who that say who that when I say who that? Who said who that when I say who that? What's the matter with you? That's just an echo. Just an echo. See that? What I tell you. There's nothing to be scared of. That's what you think. Boys, here we go again. Get away from me! 
I, Montague Brook, being of sound mind, do hereby make my last will and testament. I hereby bequeath my castle in Goblin's Knob and all the treasures therein contained to my beloved niece, Hilary Brook, on the condition that she shall spend the night of the date of the reading of this will in the castle. If for any reason she should fail to spend the entire night in the castle, the estate shall become the property of the trustee, my lifelong friend, Attorney Claude Millenhead. Spend the night in the castle? Why, that place has been haunted for 20 years. I'd, I'd be afraid. Then you refuse to spend the night there? Ah, uh, just a minute. Miss Brooke will spend the night in the castle. And Mr. Costello and myself will be there to see that no harm comes to her. Very well. If you choose to challenge the supernatural to take your life in your hands, you're perfectly welcome to try it. Here is the key to the haunted castle. Hello? Hello? There's nothing to it, Louie. Listen. Hello? Hello? Go ahead, try it. It's fun. Merry Christmas. Happy New Year. <laughs> Take it easy, please. Where are you going? I don't like the echoes. You don't like the echoes. Are you sure that's echo? Certainly they're echoes. Let me see it then. Go ahead, look. Listen. Yeah. Uh -huh. oh, wait a minute, watch it. Uh -huh. Go ahead, try it. Uh -huh. Go ahead. Uh -huh. Go ahead, try it. There you are. That's uh -huh. okay. During the 1940s, when America was in the midst of war and economic problems, Hollywood used the supernatural not only to make us laugh, but to better understand our own lives. There is no finer example of this than in Thornton Wilder's Pulitzer Prize winning play, Our Town. One can go back in memory and live each of those days over again. And there's a wonderful speech in Thornton Wilder's uh, Our Town, where Emily has died and she's allowed to come back to Earth for one day. There's Mama coming downstairs to make breakfast. Mama. I can't bear it. Why did they ever have to get old? Mama, I'm here. I'm grown up. Oh, I love you all. Everything. I can't look at everything hard enough. And she can pick any day she wants. So she picks, um, I think she picks a birthday because she thinks it won't be painful. And what happens is she comes back, her ghost comes back, and she begins to realize that Mama, look at me. Please look at me just for one minute as if you really see me. Shh, Mama. Twelve years have gone by. I'm dead. I married George Gibbs, Mama. Wally's dead, too. Mama, his appendix burst on a cabin to Crawford Notch. We felt just terrible about it, don't you remember? Just for a moment now, we're all together. Mama, let's be happy just for a moment. Let's look at one another. And at the end of it, she says, Oh, Earth, you're too wonderful for anyone to ever realize you. Does anyone ever realize life while they live it? I'm your guardian angel. Yeah, yeah, I know. Frank Kepper's It's a Wonderful Life shows us the importance our life has on the world around us. Jimmy Stewart's guardian angel teaches him what his home life would be like had he never existed. Well, then why am I seeing all these strange things? Don't you understand, George? It's because you were not born. Well, if I wasn't born, who am I? You're nobody. You have no identity. Oh, what do you mean, no identity? My name's George Bailey. There is no George Bailey. You have no papers, no cards, no driver's license. 
No 4F card, no insurance policy. You've been given a great gift, George. A chance to see what the world would be like without you. Tommy! Hey, Jenny, Susan, where are you? They're not here, George. You have no children. Where are they? What have you done? All right, put up your hands. No fast moves. Come on out here, both of you. Bert! Thank heaven you're here. Back there. Bert! What's happened to this house? Wait, where's Mary? Where's my kids? Watch them, Bert. Bert, Ernie, come on, come on. what's the matter with you two guys? You, you, you were here on my wedding night. You both of you stood out there on the porch and sung to us. Don't you remember? I think I better be going. Look, now, why don't you be a good kid and we'll take you into a doctor. Everything's going to be all right now. Bert, now listen to it. Ernie, will you take me over to my mother's I'm house? Sure. Bert, listen, that's that fellow there. He says he's an angel. Yeah. He's trying to hit the... I hate to do this Bert, to you, bud, but... Oh! Ryan George! Ryan George! You take a motion picture like, uh, it's a wonderful life. Uh, Jimmy Stewart calls on an angel to come and help him, and the angel comes down. Well, that's a supernatural event. And the public accept it as a matter of course. But actually, I think that all of these areas of the supernatural should be accepted, or at least given credit for being something that, that, that we should all investigate and know more about. Your brother, Harry Bailey, broke through the ice and was drowned at the age of nine. That's a lie. Harry Bailey went to war. He got the Congressional Medal of Honor. He saved the lives of every man on that transport. Every man on that transport died. Harry wasn't there to save them because you weren't there to save Harry. You see, George, you really had a wonderful life. Don't you see what a mistake it would be to throw it away? Clarence! Help me, Clarence! Get me back! Get me back! I don't care what happens to me! Get me back to my wife and kids! Help me, Clarence, please! Please! I want to live again! I want to live again! I want to live again! Please, God, let me live again! <laughs> Hey, George! George! You all right? Hey, what's the matter? Now, get out of here, Bert, or I'll hit you again. Get out of here. What the Sam Hill are you yelling for, George? You... George? Bert, do you know me? Know you? <laughs> you kidding? I've been looking all over town trying to find... Bert! What do you know about this? Merry Christmas! Why is there so much talk of ghosts? the supernatural, the unexplained. Well, we're slow to let go of the people we believe in. Maybe, just maybe, they're also slow letting go of us. We don't know exactly where we come from, how our consciousness evolves. We don't know exactly where it goes. Religion has been founded to give an answer to this question. And superstitions taking the place of religion in many cultures, trying to give people an answer to the problems that beset their lives. This is the eternal mystery. And only the supernatural seems to afford some clues to the answer. All those important things, mother and daughter, husband and wife, enemy and enemy, money and miser, all those terribly important things, the earth part kind of burns away, burns out. And what's left? What's left when memory is gone and your identity, Mrs. Smith? Something eternal. We all know down in our bones that something is eternal, and that something has to do with human beings. All the greatest people that have lived for the past 5,000 years have been telling us that. And yet you'd be surprised how we lose sight of that fact. There's something eternal about every human being. And it's Gertrude Stein. When she was on her deathbed, Alice B. Tuckless said to her, Gertrude, Gertrude, 
what is the answer? And Gertrude Stein looked up like with her dying breath and said, what is the question? I believe that whatever happened in this case was not simply a mental disturbance. It was something beyond that and something inexplicable and paranormal phenomena were undeniably taking place in connection with it. I'm much more open to when people say, hey, we have a ghost, you know. Before I would have said, yeah, sure, you got a ghost, yeah, sure. Today I'll listen and I'll, 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 I'll believe them. Right after that happened, a gal friend of mine had come back from London living in an actor's house and she was reading a book in a corner of a room and suddenly the hairs in the back of her head stood up. It was a huge house and she looked up from the book and she claims in the corner was a ectoplasmic kind of shimmering object. She ran about 400 yards to the nearest house. A woman opened the door and she took one look at my girlfriend and said, oh, you've seen the ghost, have you? At which point my girlfriend passed out. And that happened right after this story that I did. So put them all together and what do you got? Ghosts. But when it comes to ghosts, when it comes to, to uh, uh, apparitions, we tend to sort of smile a little and scoff at them. But I am one person who actually saw one. I think it'd be marvelous if there were some way that we could establish real contact with this other dimension where I believe a lot of us go when we die. There's a lot of research to indicate that with a near-death experience, people find themselves traveling at the speed of light into another dimension where they meet people who have gone on who have died before them. And if that really is a plane of existence, I think it might be possible to make contact with that plane of existence. The Greeks talked about it, the Romans talked about it, the Chinese have talked about it, and the Indians have talked about it. The yogis do make contact. I think it'd be wonderful if we could do it in a scientific way to prove that there is something important beyond this life. Whether you are a skeptic or a believer, we can all agree that the unknown is and always has been a fascination for all of us. And next time you walk into a dark room, think twice when you take it for granted that you're alone, especially if you're in Hollywood. Haunted Hollywood, that is. Get it through your head. I can't love you. 